why I'm here today talking to you here in this amazing special place. It's because of a slug story, basic slug story. You know how those stories go, you know? I couldn't have my pocket money when I was a kid. You know, grow up in Switzerland, you know, picture this. This white peak, green field with nice little chalet. Can you see that? Yeah? Well, it's not there. It's up north, foggy, raining, the most jobless area in Switzerland. You usually never get away from that place. I live in a tiny village. It's a dead-end road. There's nothing after that. You feel like you are at the end of the world. And I grew up there. I'm from there. And I've got two brothers, one older, one younger. And I, I keep going back to my father saying, I need some pocket money, give me money. He said, no way, <laughs> I'm going to get money. Uh, anyway, I, I annoy him so much that one day he said, OK, we make a deal. I've got the garden full of slug. You collect 100 slugs, and I give you one dollar. Hmm, interesting. I spent all my time in a garden when it was raining, because those slugs were coming out when it was raining, right? Collect all those slugs, 600 I needed. And what I, what I would do with those six dollars, I would run in town and buy National Geographic. I was seven years old. So tonight, it's the first presentation that I do here in National Geographic DC. And I'm really proud to talk to you tonight. It's really something really deep in my heart. This is the example that dream comes true. Because I want, as a little girl, to travel to those weird, incredible places. So I spent my childhood in the forest. I had this amazing guidebook bird book, you know. On the front page, there was this beautiful blue bird with a bit of red and yellowish thing on the back. But they forgot to tell me that I was not in Europe and not in my country. So I spent all my childhood in the woods looking for that bird, you know. My parents were quite happy I was in the woods somewhere looking for birds, you know. Anyway, I took my revenge on this one. And I would like to invite you with me tonight. We're going to be starving, it's going to be hot, you're going to see snakes and crocodiles. Welcome to Dropped into the Wild Corner, my most recent expedition. My concern was how we're going to feed the world today. Because I was in China, I saw all these Chinese people build houses like one, like it's really high, and a lot of people in the same room. And I thought, how are we going to do this? How are we going to keep using the planet that way? I, I was concerned about, it's, it's going to be somebody hungry in this world in some ways, in some times coming up. How are we going to do this? So I decided to take on a journey. I wanted to understand how we can do this. Go back to the roots at the time of the gatherer and hunter. Yes. I will find my own food in my own turn, following the Aboriginal people. They've been doing this for 60,000 years, right? So, but as usual, expedition really start when things go wrong and start to be really going wrong at the first minute of the expedition. So I land in a little town on the northwest corner of Australia called Kununanara word like, like that long. It's a weird, to weird town where you've got cowboy, aboriginal people, mining people, all mixed together. Arrive there with a little airplane, land, and I open my phone. My dear friend, supposed to be there, helping me for one month to go and check all my techniques, surviving techniques that I've been learning over the years included really technical fishing techniques. And I received this lovely text where he was saying, sorry, darling, I can't make it. I was like, what? <laughs> We've been planning this for a year. How you, how, what? 
And I tried to call him like 15, five times, never answer the phone. And I called my team back in Switzerland. I said, hey guys, how are we gonna do this? And my assistant was getting agitated. He said, Sarah, my God, you, you have to leave in four weeks time. How are we gonna do this? I said, you know, darling, when things get agitated like that, there's only one option. I'm going to drink coffee. You know, you know, in nature, when there is a danger, when there is something so intense, animals just stop and froze. I'm just going to stop and froze and drink coffee until I see a sign in front of me. That's it. And I can hear my assistant, you are crazy, darling. <laughs> I did that. Stop in the coffee shop, drink for five hours. The night went down. I took my little car, went um, to find my accommodation that night. I booked a room in the farm, and this lady received me. She was waiting for me, and she just walked out of the door of the property. She had a designer dress on, pink dress, beautiful, hair done, makeup on. I was like, what? I'm in the remotest location in the bush in Australia, and she's, she's wearing this kind of thing? I thought, this woman never going to help me, not this one, you know. Went to bed. Anyway, the next morning, she'll knock on my door, and she says, Sarah, do you want to have a coffee with me? I say, oh, lovely, yeah. Why not, you know? Anyway, we had coffee, and she say, what bring you here, darling? I say, well, I'm coming to walk. I try not to deliver too many information at the same time, because usually I get arrested before I do anything. So <laughs> I learned my lesson in China when I get arrested by the special forces. I learned my lesson in Laos when the drug dealer arrested me. I learned my lesson in Mongolia when Mongol men run through my camp every night, try to steal my stuff. So, yeah, I was up to do some walking. And she said, she jumped on her seat, really, literally jump. And she said, well, I just come back from Europe. I did the Camino in Europe. I was like, what? She was a walker. Anyway, she said, you want some brownie? I said, of course I want some brownie. She, I've got some fresh brownie coming from the oven. I said, yes, let's have some brownie. And we, we start chatting like two women can chat. And she said, don't worry, wait. She took the phone, make like five phone calls. She said, OK, you've got a meeting tomorrow with this one. Uh, then a coffee at four with this one, dinner with this one. I said, who is those women? You will see, go, I don't have time to come with you, but you manage. Anyway, in a week time, I make this networking of powerful woman in this town, the lawyer of the town, the doctor of the town. I had all of them on the wire, my wings, and they pushed me and helped me to rebuild my expedition. Reroute completely my expedition, restart from scratch. And four weeks later, I was ready to go. But everybody that I was talking to, having the same conversation over and over, saying to me, it's a drought year. There is not enough water in the bush. You will not be able to survive. Everybody was saying that. And you know, when people have always got this opinion about my expedition, they look at me, they judge me, this, they look at me and they think, well, this blondie thing here, she's, she's not good for these things, you know. Anyway, I thought maybe this time, I better listen a little bit. And I decided to do a test. And before, I wanted to spend some time with Aboriginal people. That's how I met Juju in a center. It's a full blood Aboriginal woman, really important woman in her community. And the young people around her is the new generation. They, they're her, the kids of her sister. So you can see the, the, the pure blood. It's really rare to find some pure blood Aboriginal th those days. And we went. Um, on a tour together in a bush. We spent some time in a bush, and she would give me some tricks, but she would not give me all the tricks. 
She didn't know that I know. You know, she didn't know that I've been preparing these things for 20 years. So she would give me the tricks, but not all of it. She would give me the wrong plan to look for. Not the good, ripe one. She would give me the young one, where there was no, nothing to eat there. And I was wondering, more I spent time with her, what's going on here? Why she doesn't give me the full trick? Is it because she feels like I don't own my past through her land? Or it is because she doesn't want me to get hurt and go back home? I didn't know what she was thinking. I didn't know what everybody was thinking, really. I decided to do a test. And I just did that. I went bush, get dropped with a li little uh, plane, walk for seven days, and discover exactly what they were talking about. There was not enough food there. <laughs> they were right, actually. So I decided to take a plan B with me. I decided to take 150 grams of flour per day as a plan B, if things go wrong, you know. So look like that. It's a little flat bread. And I wonder today if it was a good idea. Because you know when you've got in your pack food, you're so starving, but you're not allowed to touch it. It's like having the fridge full of food and you like you in a diet, right? Can't touch it, right? It was horrible. But I decided to, to do this that way. So let's go. We're going to get dropped with a helicopter northwest of Australia, precisely there. Where is nobody there? It's empty land, no human. Oof, that's for me. So get dropped there with the helicopter. The pilot said to me, Are you sure you want to get dropped here? There is nothing here. I said, This is exactly where I want to get dropped here. And he said, okay, good luck. <laughs> and he fly away. And I can hear the ch -ch 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 ch 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 And then nothing. So welcome in Australia. Well, we can see it's not flat at all, right? So the good thing about this, it's there is valley here. So on the bottom of the valley, we've got a bit of water. So you've got water, a bit of green thing means we're going to find food. So this is always a bit the same story. You've got water, you've got frog, frog, you've got snakes, snakes, you've got crocodile. It goes like that a bit. Like, uh. So I knew that. So that's how I start my journey. So rule number one, do not camp near the water. Do not take your water two times in the same spot. The first time, you're going to be OK. But the second time, it will get you. So this kind of area there, it's full of things like crawling, spider everywhere, snakes. But two types of crocodile. One is sweet water crocodile. They are lovely, really lovely creature. They talk to you, you talk to them. It's it's really lovely relationship. And then you've got the other one. It's a big, salty crocodile. They eat cattle, horses, big thing, human, they love it. So they eat those things, they turn them around, they put them underneath the water, under a log, and make you leave you there for a few weeks. So you get really tender, they go back there. So it's all about managing your landscape, right? So I was there. Lovely camp, look. Afternoon, I've got a little fire going on, my little house, and far enough away from the water. So I'm there taking my water. So I'm, I'm really safe there. So I've got a bucket of water, like a flexible bucket of water, like a plastic thing. And I put my rope at the end of it, and I decide to take my water. So I throw that thing in the water and retrieve the bucket. And unfortunately, the thing didn't open properly. I was like, Sarah Marquis, really? Are you that good? It's going to be good, you know? It's going to be a really long journey like that. Anyway, I start again, open the thing, 
throw that thing in the water again and retrieve it. That's it. This time I'm going to get it right. I retrieved this, this bucket, and suddenly there was this branch in the middle. And I was like, ah, oh, I haven't seen that branch. Really? Getting better? And I just did this little push like that, you know, just for the bucket to go over the branch. And suddenly the branch was like pulling me back. That was my first crocodile fight. Yeah, that was the kind of welcome uh, party, you know. And that was the beginning of a really long relationship. So how you deal with crocodiles? Well, you have to learn. You have to be aware of your surrounding at any moment. It's really important. It's valuable for us here also. So um, that day, that was a special day that day. I tell you, I did amazing discovery. I was exhausted, as usual, you know, and starving, because I've been starving quite a lot. And um, that was a laundry day. I, I washed a bit my stuff on the way, you know. Right. So I had my long, um, it's like a long shirt, long sleeve, and I took some water and I decided to wash it. So I, I squeeze it, and then I decided to have a nice, you know, to get rid of that water a little bit. And suddenly I hear a noise, like a quinky noise like that. I was like, what? And suddenly you were, I'm just like, under the bushes, straight away, looking for what's going on. Because you don't want to stand like a like, big, tall asparagus in the middle of the bush. Eh? This is a, do not do this, right? You have to be on the ground all the time. And then I'm there waiting to see that bird. Because I, I know all the birds, I know all the plants. I've been studying that landscape for days and years. Never heard about that bird. Anyway, I forgot about that thing, took my jacket and smashed it again. I hear the same noise. It's like, really? But it was not coming from the bush. It was coming from that cliff. And on the bottom of the cliff, I just get on the, on the edge of it. And I saw all these little crocodiles line up, talking to mom. I discovered that day the call of the crocodile. Yeah, scientific discovery. See? So I've been studying this for a long time before I head off an expedition. Nobody could actually tell me what was the trick to know if it was a crocodile in the water or not. The Aboriginal people used to go in the water with two stones, getting inside the water, and smash the stone together. And then they would make a little noise, and then they would know if there is a crocodile there. Well, that's a bit too late, right? You're just in the water already. <laughs> It's like the soup supper thing. You are on the menu. So you don't want that. So I'm, nobody never told me what to do, actually, to know if it's the crocodile there. So I discovered the call of the crocodile that day. And that was a good day for me, because the day coming on from there, I will actually smash my shirt, put a bit of water on the bottom, and I will actually discover if there was crocodile there or not. So when you're going to do those things, the only thing you have to know, you have to be able to read the landscape like a treasure map. I will find sometimes some water just because I find a little bird on a type of, a type of tree. Because I know all those birds. The little red bird, the diamond finch, I know they can fly five kilometers around only. And I know they have to drink two times a day. So I know there will be water around. Or if I find a type of plant, I will know exactly what kind of roots I can find. And I can find food. My food, it's all I've got, you know. You know, you realize after you peel, you know, it's, it's life is like an onion. You peel the onion, once you peel, where you come from, who you are in this society, and you get to the core of things, you realize that things are really simple, actually. We, are, we all want the same thing. We want the fa our family to be safe. We want food, water, shelter, basic. That was my worrying. This is my breakfast. 
every morning it would be easy for me to find my breakfast. I would eat those kapok flour. And those flour are incredible, because they're a bit juicy, a bit gluey, no much taste, but that will fill my tummy. So after a while, after a few weeks, my tummy will actually, the side of my tummy will stick together. I will, I will be so starving, like I couldn't sleep at night. And that's, after three weeks I thought I was hungry, but wait, it took me three months, you know. So I start to get better at looking for food. And this is a typical good day where I eat pandanus spiralis. This is a bunch of uh, plant, spiky plant, really spiky. So the way to eat this is to go in the middle with your legs. There's not much easy way, right? You, you want the fresh little young in the middle. So you take your, your, your hand. You have to embrace the pain in one stage, right? So you go in the middle, you grab the spiky thing, and then in a really quick, fast go, you collect the middle bit. And then, if you're lucky, at the end of it, you've got two centimeters to three centimeters of white chewing thing. And it's actually fiber. You can eat that. And that will fill up my tummy. It's all about filling the tummy, you know. I will walk 12 hours a day, climbing, going through really harsh terrain. And then I will reach that tree. This tree, will be on my way all the time. What do you think about it? It's like a lot of fruit, right? So I reach this tree, and I look at the tree, and look on the ground. First thing, look on the ground. No kangaroo, no birds eating that thing. There is no poo on the bottom of that tree, no sign of anybody using that tree. I don't like it. <laughs> but I'm starving, you know? So, look at that tree, I'm thinking, well, you know what? I learned how to do things, yeah? I'm good, you remember? At surviving. So, the rules is to take the fruits, smash it in your, in your wrists here. That's the most thin skin that we've got. And then, if there is no reaction, you know the fruit is kind of edible. Then you go phase number two, you put a bit of thing inside your mouth here. No reaction. You can go for the tongue. Wait for hours, because some of those fruit, you need to wait for the toxic to get out of the thing. If you kind of safe after four hours, if you got no tingling in the mouth or in the tongue, right? I know that, right? Well, so what I do, I get there, take the fruit, squeeze a go, <laughs> because I don't feel like it, you know. <laughs> because I'm really starving, right? So I did that, like, it was like, oof. It was like a Schweppes, like, like a Schweppes on steroid, you know, like, oh my God, this is disgusting. And I tried to split it out and, and everything, and I was like, ooh, wrong move, Sarah. Anyway, I passed that tree. And I keep, over the days, I keep, meet, I keep having that tree on my, on my journey, and every time I see that tree, I'm like frustrated, you know. And one thing you don't want is to get me frustrated. This is a do not do this. So I get to that tree again, and I took, talk to him and say, right, I know you're not good for me, but let's try it a bit again. And I squeeze again, a little bit squeeze, and I start to kind of like it, you know. Like, you know, we think, we cannot get used to thinking. Well, we can use to a lot of things. We can get used to things. I start to get used to this really horrible test. And one day, I was really tired, having one of those really bad days. And I saw that tree many times on my way during the hours following this long day. And I keep sitting under that tree and having a go until when I start to stand up, I had this blur vision of the landscape. I'm thinking, oh, Sarah, too much of a good thing, it's a bad thing, right? <laughs> so I abused of this substance, and I had, 
I lose, the, I lose my vision. So you learn on the way also. I know a lot of things, but we learn on the way. The only way to learn is to get out of our comfort zone, jump out and be here and test it. This is the only way to grow and to get to that beautiful people that we all are in this, in this room. This is valuable for the life. This is a life lesson. Get out there and try. Don't stay in your own juice. <laughs> this is my rule. Because when you know how to do things, you become a master of what you do. And then what? It's boring. You don't grow. You start to be a bit uh, not a happy person. Hey, let's get out there. Try a few different things. You never know what's going to happen.